good. Well, good afternoon. I, I'm actually uh, right, on time. right on time, which is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I've been doing this work for a very long time, uh, and I have learned so much this morning uh, in terms of the work that's been happening here, and particularly struck by Ted's work. Um, and I, I whispered to my friend Colleen LaBelle, uh, yeah, I was thinking Regina LaBelle, Colleen LaBelle. And, and you know, part of what it affirmed to me is what we know with people with chronic diseases. You don't get well all at once that it takes time for people to get well. Um, so I really uh, appreciate all the presentations. Um, but I'm really honored to uh, get to do this uh, today. Um, you know, as the Great Consent Center got started over a year ago, we wanted to do a lecture series to uh, go along with it. And as we were talking about who should be the inaugural speaker for our Great Consent uh, Center lecture series, we couldn't think of anybody better than uh, Dr. Nora Volkoff to be doing this work. So we waited a while uh, for her to get here. Uh, we were actually thrilled that her uh, 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 ability to speak and to deliver this lecture came at a time we were doing this symposium because uh, no one is better positioned to be able to do this. So I'll read a little bit of her formal bio and then uh, I promise Nora I won't say anything embarrassing uh, in terms of the work they're, they're doing. Um, so Nora Volkov is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And before you give her a hard time about the name, because we know words matter, it will actually take an act of Congress to change the name of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So don't, please don't give her a hard time uh, for that name. Uh, so uh, NIDA supports most of the world's research on the health aspects of drug abuse and addiction. But what, what makes her I think extraordinarily special is that her work in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain, which has completely reframed uh, our thinking about how we treat people uh, with substance use disorders. As a research psychiatrist and scientist, Dr. Volkov pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic effects of addic and addictive properties of drugs. Her studies have documented changes in the dopamine affecting system among others, the functions of the frontal brain regions involved with motivation, drive, and pleasure in addiction. She has also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging. So pretty remarkable she has published. This is within October, so I'm sure these numbers have gone up since then. Dr. Volkov has published more than 680 peer-reviewed articles and written more than 100 book chapters. Uh, during her professional career, she has been the recipient of multiple awards. In 2013, she was the Samuel J. Heyman Service to American Medal finalist and was inducted into the Children and Adults with uh, ADHD Hall of Fame. She was elected to membership of the Institute of Medicine in the National Academies of Science, received the International Prize from the French Institute of Health and Medical Research for her pioneering work in brain imaging and addiction science, and was awarded the Carnegie Prize in Mind and Body Sciences from Carnegie Mellon University. She has been named one of Times Magazine top 100 people who shape our world, one of the 20 people to watch by Newsweek Magazine, Washingtonian Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women in both 2015 and 2017. Uh, and an innovator of the year by U.S. News and World Report, and one of 34 leaders who are changing healthcare by Fortune Magazine. Dr. Volkov was the subject of a two, uh, 2012 profile piece by 60 Minutes and was featured speaker at TEDMED in 2014. So I have to say on a personal note, during my time in Washington, I got to some w work with some very smart and very cool people. Probably none smart, smarter and cooler than the person that I'm introducing. President Obama came in a close second. <laughs> at the Office of National Drug Control Policy at the White House, we had no closer partner than Nora and her staff at NIDA. And that's as it should be. Drug policy should flow from science, evidence, and data, infused with principles of compassion and social justice, not driven by anecdote, fear, and punishment. For those of you who have not met her or listened to her, you will soon find out that it is no coincidence that the, she, she is the director of NIDA. Her trajectory to this job was formed at an early age by a sense of inquisitiveness, and particularly inquisitiveness about how her own brain works. But what makes her really special is that she has been guided at a very young age by two overriding principles that her parents taught her. When it comes to freedom, you don't compromise, 
and how do I improve the lives of others? So it really gives me a great privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Nara Volkov. Mike, thanks very much. That was really very, very nice of you. Very nice introduction, and you're just basically uh, upping up the expectations, right? <laughs> Obama second, give me a place. <laughs> that would be fantastic. But um, and it is. Uh, you're all very lucky, actually, to have uh, Mike Botticelli here in Massachusetts, and and uh, it's a loss for us in Washington. It has been a terrible um, loss, particularly for us at NIDA, including, I mean, and very much for me, because he has been um, one of the most courageous partners in the fight against, uh, against drugs in general, and of course, incredibly important work uh, for the opioid crisis. So for us in Washington, it's a big loss, but uh, like everybody says, where there are losses and wins, and you all win. So I'm glad that you're all doing this. Uh, we are at a stage in, uh, in our country, I, I actually, and I devoted all my life to, to uh, addiction and to try to understand what drugs do to the brain and um, how can we actually prevent those harms and how can we help people that become addicted. And so that has been my mission. And as a physician, I've been very frustrated because in the process, I uh, very clearly, the healthcare system has always had this total and absolute indifference towards addiction. And I would take it further and say it's not just indifference, it's stigmatization for addiction. And so as a medical student, and then as a resident in psychiatry, and then as a, as a young attending, a psychiatric attending, I was constantly frustrated by the, the re rejection of the component of addiction that we were ex seeing in, in medical patients or in patients with psychiatric diseases. And I was also extremely frustrated by the criminalization of people that were addicted. And so to me, it became clear, and that's why I took this position, in fact, because I love research and I love science. But I recognize that as director of NIDA, I could help accelerate the knowledge in such a way that we could change culture, we could change the, that indifference of the healthcare system, we could make them our allies. And the same thing, we could change the way that we are uh, basically criminalizing the person that is addicted. And, and that is exactly what I took that job. And that was exactly 15 years ago and one day, I started on May the 2nd. And, and, I, and it basically, I'm someone that is very persevering. I don't give up and don't give up and don't give up. But, but of course, it has, in the process, been very frustrating to see how slow everything is moving. And now with the opioid crisis, everything has accelerated. And we are now at the moment that we uh, basically have the opportunity and it's starting to change to do that, to bring the concept of the importance of the healthcare system in addressing the opioid crisis on the one, but also uh, in terms of the justice system, if we are going to get individuals that are addicted in justice system for whichever reason they end up there, it's a unique opportunity to link them with care. And that will improve their outcomes in terms of their disease, but also will prevent reincarceration. We are at that time. But it's also, on the one hand, it's, it's very exciting to see that, but at the same time, we have to be very aware that we cannot miss this opportunity. We cannot. And also, in the process, recognize that we need to strengthen this, uh, the state of our knowledge and our infrastructure to address addiction, such that when we're able to contain the epidemic, we don't lose the territory that we have gained. And as we think forward about the processes uh, and the new interventions that we're making, we have to think about them in terms of their sustainability. And their sustainability, uh, it goes where, beyond just the opioid crisis while at the same time recognizing that we cannot just very much say it's only the opioid crisis, but that there is an overall problem that we have of addictions that we cannot ignore. So we, we cannot do that what we've done in the healthcare system, ignore uh, the rest of the addiction. So th that would be my message. But right now, as we are observing it, we are here to try to find out how science can help us actually address the opioid crisis. And I, and I think it is uh, clear that uh, science has many solutions. It basically, uh, we can integrate and coordinate those efforts. And you are those, you are the soldiers out there in the trenches. So basically, my job as a director of NIDA is to be able 
to facilitate resources for you to be able to come up with the solutions. And then once you have those solutions for us to facilitate the integration with other agencies in partnership with all of you. I mean, this is the only way that we're going to address the problem of drugs in our country and the opioid crisis is by actually really integrating in a strategic way our, our uh, efforts. So this is what brings us here. I like to present it because I think that we ca it's one of those things that we can uh, never exaggerate showing it up. It speaks for itself about, because I saw it, this is, this is a lesson on history. This is what has happened on the basis of the way that we address opioid use disorders. Yes, it was triggered by pain, the need to treat patients with pain. But what allowed, what permitted these very improper practices of overprescriptions and the lack of recognitions of the problems that uh, these drugs were creating was the fact that the healthcare system has never been interested on paying attention to addiction and the lack of an educational process. These are the consequences of this indifference and this stigmatization. And I think that the numbers themselves say we cannot continue doing the things that we were doing in the past because that's going to actually accelerate the number of, of, of deaths. So these are deaths from overdoses. And you see the same, the, 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 what, what also it brings up is how rapidly it has grown. I also think it's fascinating to also the, the geographical heterogeneity in the country. Some places are more affected than others. We're starting to see also a tremendous diversity in the nature of, uh, of the opioid crisis on the different states, which is also making it more challenging because one solution is not going to be uh, valuable for all of the counties in the country. We're going to have to understand the nature of the problem in each county and address and tailor the interventions accordingly. So that is the geography, this is the brain and the biology of opioids. Why is it that we're having this problem with opioids? Opioids were, over, the overprescription of opioids triggered that crisis and it was towards the end of the 1990s, the beginning of the 2000s, when the Joint Accreditation Committee demanded that you screen and treat pain if you wanted to be credited. That, uh, that did not come up with training or education of how to do it. So you just said to say, you have to do it, but expected magical <coughs> thinking that you will do it by, by osmosis. And that led to, and at the same time, the very, very aggressive practices from some of the pharmaceuticals to sell their products and the creation of new products that actually uh, flooded the market. And we have a system, and I think I'm bringing it up, because we want to learn from history. We have a system in our country that allowed this to happen. Yes, there were some aspects that we can pinpoint uh, our good intentions of treating pain, but the system did not provide the education. The, the improper prescription practices that allowed uh, pharmaceuticals to go and train physicians and overprescribe them, the reimbursement models that we generated, the, 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 the demand of our uh, culture to treat everything and expect complete uh, relief of any type of, of discomfort. All of these are system issues that we, we need to address in, in now that we are viewing it. So, but from the biology, uh, opioids was uh, what started the fire because the opioid drugs act by activating the myopioid receptors. And this image here shows a three-dimensional location distribution of the myopioid receptors in the brain. And the color code reflects the areas that have different levels, with red being the highest, uh, followed by yellow. And the areas with the highest content of myopia receptors are areas of the brain that are involved in what we call the pain network. So we process pain uh, by a series of brain regions that identify the sensation, that identify the give it its emotional coloring, that actually um, competed with other stimuli, and, and, and filter it or let it pass. And that is loaded with myopioid receptors, those regions of that pain network, so that when the drug uh, binds to it, you actually inhibit those sensations. And that's why they are so extraordinarily effective in relieving immediately severe acute pain. The problem is when you repeat this use, you become tolerant. So that leads to escalation of doses. And the higher the escalation, the greater the likelihood that you will have side effects. What side effects? Well, one of the most uh, dangerous is that of addiction. And that's because these receptors are also highly located in the nucleus accumbens, which is the main reward hub of our brains. And all of the drugs of abuse, all of them actually have the capacity to activate that nucleus accumbens. And opioids is one of them. It's actually one of the most potent 
uh, drugs that we have in terms of its uh, capacity to activate these reward systems, and that's why people become addicted. And also you have receptors in the areas of the brain, in the brain stem, it's not uh, illustrated here, that are responsible for uh, regulating our breathing. And, when in, and this is an automatic behavior. But when mu opioids bind to it, you inhibit it. And that's ultimately what causes the death of people that are overdosing, because the mu opioid receptors bind to it and they stop breathing and you die. So that's why the problem with these drugs emerged and has actually created a, a rampage of, of fatalities and other adverse medical consequences. We know also that all of the drugs that activate this, uh, this system, the reward system, produce adaptations when you use them repeatedly. And uh, Mike was uh, alluding to it in terms of um, the work of my group that has been studying, and now many others, how do repeated drug affects the human brain. And one of the things that it does, it downregulates uh, the dopamine D2 receptors, which is one of the proteins that basically transmits the signals from the dopaminergic system, which is in, in our brain not for us to take drugs. It's in our brain to engage us, to motivate us, to sustain our efforts. And that's why drugs can be so malignant, because they absorb that dopaminergic pathway, and they degrade the activity of these receptors. And these receptors ultimately are necessary for us when we are facing a situation of, uh, of two choices, for example, of having to make a decision that may not be the one that gives you the immediate reward, but on the long term is the one that makes the most uh, sense for survival or for your outcome. That decision of basically inhibit the propensity to go for something that is rewarding immediately require these receptors. And with repeated drug use, what has been shown here in animals, and it's all sorts of drugs, all of the drugs do this as uh, in, in humans, but the same thing in animals, don't regulate those receptors. And that makes you much more vulnerable for an impulsive action. So if someone shows me something that I like, I would be much less able to control and inhibit myself. And that puts people at high, high risk then, of course, of addictive behaviors. The, um, the thing about this is that we now know, interestingly, that if you're, run, if you're brought up in an adverse environment with social deprivation, with a lot of stress, stressors where you're a child or an adolescent, that also decreases the dopamine D2 receptors. So this is starting to help us understand why certain environments are actually more likely to increase the likelihood of drug experimentation and addiction. And, and we need to keep this in mind as we address the opioid crisis, and you will basically see how, how because we need to understand, again, what is it that we can do to prevent people from taking drugs all together. But coming back to the crisis, uh, the opioid crisis, these are the numbers that actually indicate how very rapidly we started to increase the number of opioid prescriptions. To the left, you see the prescriptions for hydrocodone and oxycodone from 1991 to 2011. It basically tripled over that time period for these two classes of drugs. And it came to be 290 million prescriptions uh, on a given year for um, Americans in 2011. So that's uh, enough to provide one month of opioids for every single American. I mean, obviously, we don't have that level of pain, nor is it justified, because when you use opioids, you want to use them for very short periods of time. But that facilitated their diversion, their abuse. And this inappropriate prescription also put people at risk to becoming addicted. Because we had thought, and that's the way that many of us were taught in medical school, and unfortunately, some places may be still, in, still teaching this, that if you have pain and you're giving an opioid, you're not going to become addicted. Now we know better. That is actually not the case. And where actually researchers using animal models are showing that in some instances, a chronic pain conditions may facilitate the transition into the consumption of high doses of opioids. So pain is not a protective factor. But we didn't know, and so physicians became very, very liberal on the way that they were prescribing opioids. Now we know, and so that, as a result of that, there has been many educational campaigns to improve prescription practices. Among the things that have happened, there's also been um, um, an updating on the guidelines for the management of pain. And the CDC guideline, which is one of the most uh, widely known guidelines, came around basically with this understanding and say, even though we don't have all of the evidence of the world, because there's not sufficient research that has been done as it relates to management of pain, it is clear 
that we know what we shouldn't be doing. And I think that this is always we want to say, where is the evidence that this is, because they have been criticized on the fact that you say you, say you shouldn't be given for more than, than one week opioids. But, but uh, they never questioned the fact that we have evidence that giving one more than one week has really dramatic, catastrophic consequences, particularly when you are doing indiscriminately. So these, uh, the CDC guidelines, as well as and an increased awareness by many that the use of opioids uh, should be restricted to certain conditions has in fact led to significant reductions in opioid prescriptions. And I have to comment on this. For example, Massachusetts has, if you compare the different states in the United States, has one of the lowest rates of opioid prescriptions. And it has had it historically. So this state, in terms of the practices, has one of the best practices. And it's still actually, there's a lot that we can do to improve them further. While at the same time, and I'm going to highlight this because I think we cannot neither forget it, we need to recognize that patients suffering from chronic severe pain actually need to be addressed. And we don't have many alternatives to give them. And if we don't address those needs, they are going to go into a black market to get opioids and or heroin and or other synthetic, putting themselves at risk. And we're seeing that happening. And so we need to understand that it's not opioids are all bad. We need to banish them. We need to understand when opioids can be useful and how to utilize them in ways that are minimally harmful to the person and maximize its potential beneficial therapeutic effects. But despite all of the, these decreases in opioid prescriptions, you all know the numbers, we have not been able to decrease the number of fatalities. In fact, the number of fatalities have been going up. And this uh, very simple graph uh, that illustrates the segmentation by the CDC on trying to understand what is it uh, that is cut, why is it that we cannot bring the opioid, prescription, the opioid deaths down, and they continue to increase approximately 22 to 24 percent per year increases. And uh, what is evident is that the, the opioid crisis has been transforming itself. It's metamorphosing. It started as prescription opioids, and you see that in green, and certainly that's what triggered the whole phenomena. But that is sort of stabilizing. It's still, we are not bringing it down. It's still contributing significantly to fatalities, and this is data from 2016. And uh, there are approximately 14,000 people dying on opioid prescriptions. But then you see the rise of heroin in our country, and that reflected the fact that heroin the, has been entering into the United States at much higher purity and much greater quantities, and it has really slowly been taking up the geography of our country. And so starting 2011, you see this very significant increase. So we had uh, kept more or less overdoses from heroin deaths approximately for the past 20 years until 2011 at, two, at 2,000. Look at that. Now they are over 14, 15,000, and they're basically surpassing the number of opioid prescription. And again, this reflects the high availability of heroin as well as its purity. Massachusetts has traditionally had, is different in that respect as a state, along with Puerto Rico, because these are two of the states with the highest rates historically of heroin. So in that respect, it is not, uh, it may not be so novel for a state like Massachusetts. And, and in fact, one of the reasons why Massachusetts has had such a high rates of overdoses, despite the fact that they have very good, much better prescription practices for opioids than the rest of the, of the country, has to do with that historical presence of heroin, which also made it a target, because what we're seeing is not just that the heroin is going down, but look at that black line, which are the synthetic opioids. So the synthetic market is an extraordinary lucrative market if, you, if you're a drug dealer. And then you target, of course, the places where there is an appetite for opioids, where people are addicted. And that's why Massachusetts is one of the targeted areas. And, as, uh, and I actually, uh, basically in terms of the statistics, and I probably you have them better than me, but what I had heard was 80% uh, of the fatalities in Massachusetts were associated with fentanyl. And again, look at when we started to see the jump in the fentanyl. We had a little bump in 2006 from a, slab, a small laboratory that was producing fentanyl in the United States that closed and then that controlled it. But now we're getting the fentanyl from China. It's illicit fentanyl that actually is crossing the border either through Mexico, but very importantly, through the mail. And, 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 and actually, it illustrates, again, one of the challenges. Fentanyl 
Again, it, we like to put quantitation, and I like quantitation, but it's, it has a, a pretty significant error margin. But it is safe to say, if you compare fentanyl with heroin, it's, it's basically 50 times more potent. It's safe to, to, to make that statement. 50 times more potent, it means you need a 50 times smaller volume in order to get the same high. That's what it means. So if you're a drug dealer and you have to carry through the border, imagine the difference of having 1 50th of the dose. You can carry it in your pocket, you can put it into an envelope, and there it goes. And, and how do you track the presence of a fentanyl in an envelope? There are millions and millions and millions of envelopes that are coming. So that, from the perspective of detecting these drugs, it becomes a very major challenge. But also, it's not just fentanyl. There are other synthetic analogs. And this is where chemistry comes as its worst that it can get. And, and one of the analogs that you've all heard about is carfentanil, because that is the analog that was just used in Russia to sedate actually the Chechnyans that had actually taken up uh, one of the rapes. And unfortunately, again, I mean, we're speaking about 50 times more potent. If you look at the uh, pharmacology, I would say carfentanil is 500 times more potent than heroin. And it's so, so potent that it's almost impossible to properly dose. And as a result of that, you have a very extremely dangerous substance in terms of actually even synthesizes and certainly delivering it. And there, there, there lies li li the problem. So what are the things when you have something that is so potent? Fentanyl is very potent or it's analog. There's another component that makes it very, very dangerous as a drug. And it's when you inject fentanyl, actually it goes immediately into your brain and immediately it attaches to the receptor. Heroin, is, it crosses the blood-brain barrier very rapidly, but then it has to be metabolized in order to bind with, into the receptor. And so it's slightly slower than the fentanyl. And this is likely to be one of the reasons why some of these first responders come and they found a, find a person already dead with a needle in their arm. It's as fast as that. And from the perspective of an overdose reversal, of course, that's a big challenge that we are facing in terms of what are the treatment interventions that we have to look at. So I bring this to actually address, as we're addressing the opioid crisis, we have to address the need of prescription opioids, better practices, management of pain. But it's no longer that going to be sufficient. We need to address heroin, and we need to address synthetic opioids. And we need to also address the fact that now more individuals are starting to, to uh, become their history on opioid, their abuse on opioids, not with prescription opioids, as was basically most of the cases, but now they're starting with, with heroin. And so your prevention efforts have to have the capacity to tailor the prescription opioids and tailor the heroin as well as the synthetic opioids. We need to understand the dynamics, and I think that the, the issue with the dynamics is that, the, again, they are changing very rapidly. So this is, we've all been aware that the prescription opioid has also uh, affected, in general, we see much, much worse outcomes in terms of overdoses, numbers are much, much greater for men than female. But when we started to look at the prescription opioid, we saw that the numbers were not so disparate between men and women. Women are in pink, as usual, and men are in blue as you may expect. But you also have, <laughs> one day I should put them the other way around and see if someone picks up on that. <laughs> but we also see that the differences, and, and I do I want to pause in there, because we have to also address that as we are addressing prevention, we need to address also tailored to the individual characteristics, gender and age. So we know that the greatest rise, uh, so this is the overdose deaths, are between 25 and 44 years of age. For the prescription opioids, the numbers actually look quite similar if you look at it. And we are seeing that the highest rates for women are between 45 and 64 years of age, which indicates that this is not a classical demographic of people abusing. This is the demographic where women are much more likely to be prescribed opioids than men, that is putting them at very, very high risk. And it also, another important component is that we now understand that more than 50% of the prescriptions for opioids in this country are given to individuals with mental illness. And most of those prescriptions go to those with a mood disorder. And those that are given these prescriptions are given higher doses. So this may be driving those numbers there. Then you go jump into heroin and synthetic, and you see that's significantly higher for males than for females. But I want you to look at the fentanyls, because that is actually where it's starting to, to see that you are having more women 
are dying from uh, synthetic opioids than they are from heroin. So it is uh, something that we've started to actually recognize that a significant number of overdose fatalities is in not just in the males, but now also in the females. So what is it to be done in terms of the science and how are we uh, coordinating our understanding of what the NIH and NIDA can do? And so this is a slide that we have been using ourselves to uh, basically highlight the areas of our portfolio that we are understanding on funding and that now Francis Collins, which has embraced this initiative, has basically started to use as not just a NIDA driven but a whole NIH driven effort. We place pain on the top because if we don't address all of the needs uh, of research that go from very basic understanding about what is the neurobiology of chronic pain, why is it that some people continue to have pain even though the insult is not there, uh, to actually help on the acceleration of alternative treatments, which basically what pharmaceutical industry has been doing in terms of investments for pain has been come up with another opioid and they're making billions of dollars but not for new things. Yes, yes, but we need to disincentivize that and incentivize them to do something else. And this is, again, one of the, the areas where the NIH, um, Francis Collins, has been a big, big leader on created, trying to create public-private partnerships to energize the pharmaceutical industry to, to, de to develop new pain medications from the science perspective. We, as well as other institutes, uh, but the two institutes that have putting more of most of the resources in this neurology and NIDA to develop the basis of new targets that can be deployed towards new medications. And the area of science is fascinating. And in, but in the basis, we have the opioid use disorder, the component that relates to treatments and the component that relates to overdose reversal and overdose prevention. Because it's actually right now there are so many people overdosing that we have to get better solutions. I'm not going to dwell on the overdose reversal. Just to say that now we are very, very lucky with having naloxone and we have, we partner with the pharmaceuticals to develop the nasal narcan, which has been a big success. But we are now recognizing that we need to invest more into that space because the, in some instances, actually, the, the uh, initial narcane or the injectable narcane are not sufficient to revert the overdoses. Some of it may relate to the fentanyl having longer effects, but some of it may relate to what we were hearing before, that many of the overdoses are actually associated with a combination of drugs, benzodiazepines and op opioids, alcohols and opioids. So being able to provide not just antagonists, me opioid antagonists, but medications that can enhance respiration. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to basically dwell rapidly in pain and then on opioid use disorder because that's where you all are coming from. Pain, extremely complex portfolio that we have with a low hanging fruit and very exciting areas of science. And so it's so exciting that I find myself that I cannot stop and say, I have to tell you this story because it is, I, I, I actually, as a medical student, the first project I worked with was uh, trying to understand what were the, our own endogenous opioid systems and, and try to see if we have, actually I was interested in knowing if we have an endogenous opioid antagonist that could account for the fact that patients would, that were addicted to opioids could have a withdrawal just by looking at someone. So I was very intrigued about how, uh, when, they, when you are conditioned, sorry, when you are conditioned um, and basically and uh, people, for example, researchers have been given for many, many years, opioids to monkeys, and then they give naloxone, and the monkey goes into withdrawal. And my mentor said to me, Nora, you know, I was the one that was giving them the naloxone, but I was the one also that on the weekends have to come and clean the cages. And we didn't give them naloxone on the weekend. When the monkeys would see him, they would go into withdrawal. They have condition. So this is the conditioning phenomena. So I, I was fascinated by that story, and I was trying to find what's the endogenous naloxone that we have in our body. But, but what, what was in that pharmaceutical that I, and I was just volunteering in, in, in this uh, research of a pharmaceutical that was trying to develop an opioid medication that was not addictive. And many others were, and there were millions, hundreds of millions of dollars done. No one succeeded. Every single opioid agonist that was developed is regarding addictive and produces respiratory depression. Now, that we know that much more, particularly as we have been able to decode the dynamic movement of the opioid receptors with technologies like cryo-EM, where you can actually look at that three-dimensional structure of the opioid receptor 
uh, when it has different types of ligands, they found that the way that the ligands, even though all of them may be agonists, move that receptor is very different. And in the process, they activate different in transcellular domains. So for example, fentanyl is the one actually over there. It basically, when it binds, it activates, sorry, to the left. It activates both the, the G protein, which is necessary for analgesia, but it also maximally activates the beta resting. And that's necessary for tolerance and respiratory depression. It's one of the most potent drugs that we have for that beta resting system, which is associated with untoward effects. So pharmaceuticals now are trying to develop an anti-fentanyl, one that binds to that opioid, but does not activate that beta resting. And Trivera 1 there is one a drug that is in phase three clinical trial, has good analgesia, and much lower uh, respiratory depression. And we're working with researchers that have compounds that are still at the preclinical levels, but have even better characteristics. So this is, again, and, 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 and a whole series of, of findings that indicate that we may be able to, to achieve the panacea, that, that of getting an opioid that's not addictive. It's, not, it's, it's now feasible, theoretical, in terms of our understanding how these opioid receptors work. And the other thing, just to put you in your brain, because I guess that's why science is so extraordinary. Have you ever, we, we have all of these drugs that you become tolerant to. I give you morphine, you'll be tolerant. At the second dose, you'll need higher dose. But haven't we wondered why is it that our own endogenous opioids, we never become tolerant to them? What is it, why are they acting differently? So through research, we now are starting to understand what's the difference between our own endogenous opioids, which are peptides, and these drugs that we are using in terms of the way that they are signaling. And that understanding, of course, is then allows, will allow us to create similar drugs to our own peptides. So that's why I say I'm very, I mean, I'm very optimistic of, in terms of our ability to move this forward, provided that we put the resources needed. But let's jump into the opioid crisis for the opioid use disorders, because uh, a lot of you who are here, and we're very grateful for you as grantees, everybody says, thanks for the, the grant from NIDA, says, thanks for your work, because, you know, <laughs> we only give the money, it's, uh, it's taxpayers' dollars, and you are doing the work. And uh, we all know, I mean, we do have these medications, improve outcomes, methadone, buprenorphine, uh, naltrexone extended release. We don't need more work to show that they are, have a large effect. We don't. I mean, it is, it is very uh, uh, surprising that how, despite the evidence, people are, are choosing to ignore it. Now, why are we ignoring? There is stigma. And there is stigma at addiction. But there's also clear, direct stigma at the medication. Or you're just changing one drug for another without an understanding about what it means. But there's also, and we've all known along, a second issue, so stigma one, second issue, we don't have sufficient infrastructure to provide with treatment for those that need them, second. Third, I would sort of say, basically important, and again, these two things are not exclusive. Medications that we have are really incredibly useful. They save lives. But still, 50% of patients will relapse in six months, which means that we could have Alternative, other medications that could help those patients that stop responding to one medication have alternatives, or that will allow us drug combinations that increase the likelihood that the person would not relapse. So yes, I, and I'm very grateful for the medications, and for many of you, because the work uh, for the medications came out of NIDA-funded research, of researchers like you that did it. But I think, like in any other area of medicine, how many antidepressants do we have? How many antiretrovirals do we have? How many anti-chemotherapeutic agents? We are the only disease for which we are seeming to feel content with three different classes. And my answer is no. The science has advanced sufficiently to come to recognize that more medications will make it easier for us to help our patients. So there is need of that. And then the fourth one, which is the big elephant too that we, we tend to forget because perhaps it's not so flashy as this very nice basic science that I'm telling you about, that basically most 80% of the individuals that have an opioid use disorder do not have in their conscious awareness that they need treatment. And we cannot engage them. So we need to change that whole narrative and the ability to bring them into treatment. Because otherwise, we can have all of these medications. If they don't seek them, if they don't seek help for their treatment, we're not going to be advancing very much. And this is where I want you all to start thinking about what are the things that we can do 
to move forward. And I'm saying this because, and I was saying this to Micah because it's actually I got word this morning that a very significant amount of money is going to be allocated to NIDA in order to address the opioid crisis. And we are actually prioritizing research that can help us evaluate uh, optimal evidence-based practices that can rapidly control the overdose fatalities. And the ability to do that in an integrated fashion is one of the things that we hope we'll be able to, uh, to de deploy the dollars for. So look how bad it is. And here we have metrics. I mean, if we have, this is a cascade of care for opioid use disorders. It's not perfect numbers because to start with, we don't have good metrics. And so item number one, if we're going to address the crisis, we need to know what the landscape is and we need to be able to monitor it. Say 2.4 million people addicted, say that most of them may be diagnosed, I don't know that that's the case, but we know that individuals that have been offered medication assisted treatment is something around 300, 325,000. And that doesn't mean that they are sustained in six months. Six months is much, much lower. So you can see that basically where you want to have at least people six months and then on recovery is basically less than 150,000. So because we have these metrics, we can follow up interventions where we can say, I want to do this to improve that and monitor our, our advances. So what are we doing? Let's, let's try to work with public-private partnerships. Let's try to develop medications that are going to be actually the easiest, the lowest hangest fruit. Extended release formulations, it makes it much easier for an in individual to be compliant with their medication if they don't have to take the decision every single day of going to their treatment physician or the methadone clinic. And that all alone is not just for addiction, for any disease, if you don't have to think about taking it. And so we know that extended release formulations improve compliance. The whole work of alternative medications, drug, drug combinations, new targets, vaccines. And these are two products. We have the extended release naltrexone, which actually has offered once a month injectable. We have the probufin, which is a six month buprenorphine implant, which in principle, uh, covering someone for six months, uh, covers you at the highest rate of risk. The problem of the implant is that it only delivers the equivalent of eight milligrams of buprenorphine. So that's not sufficient for most patients. So now we're working to try to determine are there other alternatives that can lead us to longer time coverage. We know that um, two of those products, uh, there are two products of buprenorphine, two different pharmaceuticals, one month uh, was approved by um, the Indivior compound, which was sublocate, which was approved on, by the FDA on November 30th, and uh, it actually basically results, uh, this is the data that shows that actually the, the efficacy. In terms of uh, keeping people the, um, basically without protecting them from relapse, it was equ equivalent to the doses of Suboxone. But if you look actually at the ability of the drug to prevent the consumption of high doses of, uh, of, of opioids, you can see that it has a very large effect. And that's, that data you're not showing. Because we never care. We just want clean urines. And that's another question that we're asking. Well, I think we have to go beyond clean urines. We have to decrease the use of opioids because that will prevent overdoses. And then you have a product that uh, Brayburn Pharmaceutical is trying to get approved by the FDA. We hope that it will be approved very soon. Um, it's a one week and a one month formulation. So this gives us more flexibility. We're also going after different targets. So this is, this, this, this one's of the, um, the, the actually extended release formulation at the low hanging fruit. We're trying to uh, work with, with pharmaceuticals to actually help develop, for example, a six months naltrexone medication would be extraordinarily valuable because that will prevent overdoses. And these medications, actually the one on the buprenorphine, if you look at uh, the data that has come uh, from clinical trials, they seem to also prevent overdoses. And this is an area of research that we want to establish so that this can become another alternative outcome so that, that the FDA can approve a medication not just for preventing relapse, but a medication that is used for preventing overdoses. So we're trying to expand the outcomes, uh, which will make it more appealing also for pharmaceuticals to get into this space. These are longer range. We now understand the neurocircuitry that is affected by drugs. And so we are aiming to develop uh, 
targets that can influence the different elements of the neurocircuitry of addiction. We're also working in trying to understand how behavioral interventions may ultimately also impact on that neurocircuitry. Because mind you, that our brain is very neuroplastic. Our brain is actually modeled by our experiences with the environment. Ergo, it's not surprising that a psychotherapeutic intervention that is tailored to a very specific process can modify that neurocircuitry, just like drugs can do it. And so this whole thing about just drugs or ter psychotherapy is just totally and utterly artificial. My view on this one is let's do what is necessary to help that patient be able to recover. Addiction is a severe illness, and it can be very, very devastating. So we should treat it aggressively and provide the, great, the interventions that are going to, get, to give the, that person the greatest likelihood of success. We also are developing vaccine. That's another much um, basically longer range intervention. But there, there's advances that are quite fascinating right now that allow us to actually, for example, the, the problem with vaccines for addiction, and we have vaccines uh, in humans for cocaine and nicotine, and we're about to start the trial with vaccines for heroin in humans. The problem is that the, they are not sufficiently antigenic. They don't produce sufficient antibodies. And that is why they have failed in the past. Many strategies uh, are being used, so now they are, uh, hopefully we will get more antigenic vaccines. But in the meantime, the research into making monoclonal antibodies have a longer life has actually enabled us to start to think about the possibility of developing monoclonal antibodies, for example, for fentanyl and heroin, bivalent, so that they can cover you, that can prevent someone from overdosing. So that's actually, again, is much more challenging than doing extended release formulations, but it's another space. I mean, if we, if we are not ambitious on the way that we look at things, we would have never reached the moon. We would have never done so many things that we do. So I think that thinking about this whole concept, uh, we have the science. We have to put our efforts into it. And then the other component, the healthcare, I mean, the, the opportunity to do implementation, to develop new models. And again, I want to commend Massachusetts because they actually usually use uh, what you are all doing in Massachusetts in the healthcare system. And as an example, where I send the researchers in other states to learn how the engagement of the healthcare system in the management, screening, and uh, follow up of uh, of substance use disorders can make significant uh, beneficial effects and actually can be life-saving. So Massachusetts has set the stage. So I, I bring researchers that says, go and speak with these investigators here at Massachusetts so that they can learn. And, but I'm also throwing it back at you because obviously you still have a lot of challenges. You still have very significant levels of mortality and many patients that are um, not being treated. So what is it with one of the best healthcare systems in the United States that you can do to set up and develop models that then can be translated to other places and can be sustained and aggressively implemented and changing practices. So yes, we know, this is what I would say. This is for the, all of the substances of abuse, as you know. Most Americans don't seek treatment and very few get treatment and, and very few get it in the healthcare system. And this is just actually to get you for the opioid use disorder, the number of months that people require treatment at the different times for an opioid use disorder, and in blue, that's the number of months how they have been going up versus the months where they were accessible to medication-assisted therapy. Yes, it has been slowly increasing, but the gap is just growing and growing and growing. So we need to, we need to change that. I brought up the issue of, this is the Gail Denerfrio work on identifying how the emergency department are a great opportunity to initiate buprenorphine. The moment, and we're actually, we are funding a study through the Clinical Trial Network to evaluate what are the roadblocks of implementing uh, delivering buprenorphine in emergency department across different, different uh, hospitals in the United States and different uh, communities. And we're also starting to evaluate the extent to which we can take advantage of of the extended release opioids that are called buprenorphine, extended release buprenorphine that are coming up in the market um, because that may make it actually even easier to implement in emergency department. There are many challenges, but ultimately, if we don't identify those challenges, we cannot come up with solutions. And the solutions, of course, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be very much dependent on the, the conditions of that particular healthcare system. But we're looking for those models, how good it is that ju the justice system is another incredible opportunity. And if you have not read the paper that was published, 
a couple of months ago, I think it was JAMA, or the Annals of Internal Medicine, in which Rhode Island uh, mounted a very aggressive approach to initiate treatment with buprenorphine in the jail system. And then following uh, those individuals when they are released, showing that they basically were able to decrease mortality by 60% over a one year period, 60%. And what was also very notable is that they reduced the population mortality by 12%. So the justice system is a place that we can convene uh, treatment interventions and modes of breaching the individual when they get released from prison or jail with the healthcare system. I don't know what is the situation in Massachusetts, but because this state is very progressive, I predict that you do not lose your insurance when you are in, 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 in the justice system. I, I predict, am I correct? You don't. You don't get the it's, not it's suspended. It's suspended, but it's not terminated. It's not terminated. Okay. Well, I'm not, this is not terminated. <laughs> but our jails will not implement medication-assisted treatment in a systemic way. Well, I mean, what can we do to help this change? And I think that this is uh, something that we need to change. I mean, the, the numbers are so gigantic in terms of the outcomes when you treat someone versus when you don't. This was a study that was not even done in the individuals that were released from prison. These were parolees. And just putting them on the once a month uh, naltrexone um, basically obviated all overdoses on those that were given the Vivitrol versus seven in the control group. This is saving lives. And it's saving resources. And it's actually allowing the person to recover. It is not justified not to do it. So I mean, my view is. Because what we need to do is create a dialogue to try to understand what is it we need to do in order to be more access acceptable in the justice system. That's the way I put it. And that's why I say this is a research question that we want to prioritize with the research dollars. And I think it's, it's going to be close to $200 million. This is a research project that I want us to prioritize in terms of implementation because it can have a very large effect. And this just shows that Rhode Island study that I showed there, 60% improvement. This is a, to the left a study that was done in England where they again initiated treatment in the, in the, in the prison system in England while they were there, and that decreased uh, overdoses at 85% in the first month. So these are huge effects. If you don't treat someone that has an opioid use disorder in the prison and jail and then you release them, their mortality rate is incredibly high. Is more than 13 fold higher than that of those uh, in the lay public because they are, they are no longer tolerant because they have what we call incubation of craving so that they will go to the, the environment where they basically used to take drugs, they will immediately relapse. So if you don't protect them, the likelihood of them dying is very high. So um, we end up, I want to end up with two slides. The one of education and training, because as we are thinking about this evidence-based implementation, integrated efforts, an extraordinary component is number one, I mentioned it, creating data systems that will allow us to monitor things that are happening, but also building up our training programs, training programs both in substance use disorders so that we can recognize who is at risk, we can recognize when someone is becoming addicted and we can help them, because if you don't recognize it, you are not going to be able to do anything. And the second one is on pain. Again, because this is where all started. We cannot just forget about it, because if we do, we will, as again, keep on having a um, group of individuals that are suffering and, and will go out into a black market to try to relieve for their pain. And I end up with this slide, because this slide shows the heterogeneity on drug poisoning in our, in our country, and it shows all ages in poverty also showing tremendous amount of heterogeneity. And I bring it up because it, it has um, data in his paper on the PNIS where he shows we are decreasing the survival of the Americans, the longevity of the Americans is going down, whereas it's going up in the rest of the world. And uh, this is basically due to what he calls the deaths of despair. And the deaths of despair are number one, opioid crisis, opioid overdoses. Number two, suicide. And I wonder also, too, in terms of what percentage of those overdoses are also part actually active or inactive suicide when you lose the, the, your motivation for life, even though you may say, I, I, I want to I kill myself. Um, there is a very strong component of destructiveness in that in in in, in the in, in the process of overdoses, and then the third one is cirrhosis from alcohol, 
and I bring it because it's cirrhosis from alcohol. We have a problem of addiction in our country that has been made so evident by the opioid crisis. But in order for us to address it, we also have to consider that we require a comprehensive approach. And like anything else that we do in medicine, the most important intervention that we can do is prevention. And yes, better prescription practices is prevention for the opioid use disorders. But as important is prevention of uh, drug experimentation very early on, children, adolescents, and in that transition of adolescence onto young adulthood, which is where we see the very, very steep increases in drug consumption. We need to target prevention efforts to protect those individuals not to start to experiment with drugs. And if they start to experiment with drugs, and I'm throwing it at doubt because we have minimal research there, and I think it's urgent that we start to change that. If you have someone in your practice that says, uh, com tells, confides to you that they are, or you ask them and they, they say, yes, they are, they are b basically misusing opiates, they are not addicted, you're not going to put them on buprenorphine or methadone. How do you treat them? We need research on what type of intervention is likely to be most effective in preventing that transition from misuse of opioids into addiction. So I look forward, actually, uh, in this moment where we're all here together. It's our responsibility. If we fail, it is on all of us to work together in ways that we can bring knowledge that can accelerate and change practices and that can, once and for all, hopefully, change and destroy the stigma of addiction such that we can embrace addiction, what a disease, and engage the healthcare system in its prevention and treatment. Thanks very much for your attention. We have uh, time for some questions. So why don't we start there in the back? Do we have microphones? Yep. Great. Thank you for mentioning suicide at the end. This is an upstream question. Uh, my son Jesse died of a heroin overdose uh, when he was 25. And that's what I tell people. But I know that Jesse committed suicide. I know from his history of depression. I know from even conversations with him. So I'm upstream. Parents are upstream. Now I'm a grandfather. I'm either farther upstream. And I guess my question is, is how, can we, um, how can we create a cultural shift in which we all get that each of us is upstream? And then begin to teach each other and train each other and support each other in how to be upstream as grandparents and parents and neighbors and teachers and classmates. So that's a question without an answer, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask it. Yeah, no, but, but I mean, I'm very sorry by, by the loss of your child. And I think that, I mean, it is, and I do get, uh, I hear this a lot, unfortunately, and it's the sort of thing that you say, when is one more dead enough? I mean, one dead is so devastating. But I do, I do want to, to actually answer you because I didn't bring it up, but I do think that in the opioid crisis, we need to build a coalition of the communities where each citizen can participate in trying to address the crisis. Each one of us brings something that can be very unique. And the participation of citizens was something that was very valuable with the HIV crisis. And, and trying to coordinate an effort that takes about advantage of community systems that already exist is already emerging in some of, of the counties because they are desperate. So you have some really exciting approaches for firemen, like in Manchester, New Hampshire, where they will take a person that has an addiction without asking them questions. They take them to treatment or police departments that are becoming involved, or faith-based organizations. But they are isolated elements. And, I, I, and what I, I'm trying to figure out is what is it that we can do to facilitate a platform where, where citizens can be part of bringing and preventing and containing the crisis. So you, as a parent, just like you spoke up, I do think that that's a courageous, not, all, not everyone addresses it, and, it, and in a way, is a way of communicating the, 
why we cannot weigh, why there is an urgency to address it. So there are many, many ways, but, but thinking, integrating those efforts would be very valuable. So um, I was wondering, how do you um, basically make someone feel, who is an addict feel that they are have an illness as opposed to being like demonized by the like current administration and that they're going to go to incarceration or they're going to like be uh, I don't know like taken into custody, right? So how do you make someone think that they're should seek help as opposed to just getting arrested. Yeah, and that's a cultural change that we have to do as a society. And uh, you know, I've seen tremendous amount of progress, and I'm be basically because, I mean, I get exposed to very diverse audiences. And at the beginning, when I was, uh, I, I mean, in testifying, I would have uh, sometimes being challenged and says, "Well, why do you want to put those levels of resources on people that are choosing to destroy their own lives?" And, I, and even now, and I was being asked by one of the reporters, because you also hear these questions about uh, some proposals that you shouldn't give naloxone more than one, so if someone overdoses. And, and so we still have an enormous amount of stigma, and it comes from a lack of understanding and knowledge. And, and that what we don't understand, as I said, is stigmatized. And being able to communicate, uh, and the media can play a very important role, and, and that when we're, we're discussing the issue of how can we integrate the efforts of citizens, because we also communicate with one, one, one another by interactions, and to be able to change that, and, and it's, it's very intriguing because uh, people do listen. I mean, it also depends how you communicate to them, and, and, but we also are basically, it's a whole science about that too, or neuroscience and how to optimally communicate. And we can take advantage of it to try to actually realize that one message is not going to be good for everybody and not for a one person on different circumstances. But you need to train people to do that. And I, I, I perhaps, because I mean, as a physician, since I know that, that healthcare world, I rely a lot on the healthcare system to be an important component of that intervention. But we need to go beyond that. And it has to be, of course, policy that determines uh, the fear that individuals have of seeking treatment because they don't want to be stigmatized. One of the issues that we are facing, for example, is women that are pregnant and are taking, are addicted to heroin, and they don't want to go to treatment because they are afraid that they will remove their babies. There's no need, to, I mean, th there should be a mechanism that they feel safe and protected so they can go for treatment. And the same thing, we are basically struggling all along to try to get more information about the person that has an opioid use disorder, about what medications they are on. So, because it's, if you go to a doctor, the doctor doesn't know if someone is already on an opioid medication. They don't know that they are addicted to an opioid, and do, I mean, it leads to improper practices because we can, there is privacy issues, and there is privacy issues because it's uh, if basically it's criminalized a lot. So if we change that culture, then addiction could really be in your health record. I mean, if I have cancer, that is private information. And, it, and, and there's no reason why it should be any different from addiction. B but by treating it differently, we're separating it. And we have to treat it differently, because still there is a lot of stigma. And so I guess I believe, I believe, perhaps I'm very naive, but I choose to believe <laughs> that knowledge is actually one, what, what can help you destroy stigma to make knowledge clear cut and pertinent and relevant to the situation. Let me just add, I feel humbled to say this, but one of the things that we do to communicate the value and worth of people is the language that we use. And that part of what I think we have to do, and researchers across town in the other institution, the lesser institution across town, um, have shown that the language that we use can either elicit therapeutic responses to this or punitive. So when we call people substance abusers or addicts, when we see negative portrayals in the media and use that language, so part of what I think all of us can do to kind of change the stigma and change the narrative is to think about uh, making sure that we're using clinically appropriate, non-stigmatizing language when it comes to how we refer to people with substance use disorders. So we have an opportunity before us to do that. Um. Nora, you have a very broad perspective. And I'm wondering if you have 
seen things internationally that have been tried addressing substance use problems, opioid epidemic, specifically perhaps, that you think we should be thinking about in the U.S.? Well, I think that, that the group, had, the international intervention that actually has impressed me a lot has been what has been going on at Vancouver, University of British Columbia. And they've been extremely proactive in deploying and expanding access to medication-assisted treatment. And in treatment, I mean, they basically also very, very proactive in, treatment, in treating HIV and hepatitis C. And in one of the most affected areas, they've been able to actually show that they can bring the incidence of these uh, infectious diseases by having, uh, investing the resources that are necessary. Um, whatever is necessary, you come to the patient in whatever stage they are ready. I mean, of course, we want to be able to, for patients not to have to rely on heroin. But if they are not ready, and you, you just cannot, you say it's either my way or their way, that's not what we do as doctors. So you work with them to try to bring them there, but in the process, you help them. And that has been their strategy and um, with a very strong healthcare model. So that's probably one of the most impressive strategies that I've seen in terms of handling the opioid crisis. I think we had a question back here. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eileen, and then we'll go over there. Hi, I'm, I'm a pediatrician here. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. I just wanted to make one comment and then ask a question. So as a pediatrician who works a lot with families um, with addictions, I just feel like the focus needs to be at least partly on child mental health. Um, I saw a boy yesterday who I saw a year ago. He was 12 a year ago. It was quite clear he had, he had really severe obsessive thinking. I made a referral to our integrated behavioral health program and see him a year later, well, they never went. So I made another referral, brought the social worker, and, and the boy's 13 now and delightful, and he said to me, does this mean I'm crazy if I need to see a therapist? So we had a long conversation about what was their resistance to getting treatment, and the, the thing that I said to the mother that made the biggest difference is he will find relief somewhere. Like these symptoms are paralyzing to him, and he's you know, missing a lot of school, he's not going out with his friends because he can't stop these loops in his head, he will find a way to relieve this if we don't help him now. And lots of mothers of young children will tell me about their ADHD or their anxiety or their depression as kids, and that you know the first time they used heroin, it was the, like the warmest hug they ever got. And that they were suffering as kids, but there was so much resistance to addressing the very high prevalence of mental health disorders in kids that they will find their relief somewhere else. My question for you is, are you aware of any um, programs that are addressing uh, prevention of addiction at, at an early age, of dialogues where parents can talk with their kids about, this happened to me, I don't want it to happen to you? Yes, no, there are several evidence-based uh, programs uh, on prevention that are targeting very young children. Uh, which have shown actually quite beneficial effects. And, and this evidence-based prevention go from universal interventions to more tailored interventions to those that are greater risk. And we can give you a linkages into, into those, uh, th those programs. They are not being utilized. I mean, that's part of the other problem that we have. I mean, so we have evidence that it's not used. It's like the cascade of care that I show you. We have evidence that medication works, but it's not being used. And the same thing is very frustrating with the prevention. And so that's why I like to end up with the opioid crisis. We need to address the importance of prevention, in prevention of drug utilization in general. Because you start with one, and then you escalate. And if not, we're going to go constantly be the, going after our tails. And I do, I'm very sensitive to the whole issue of um, incipient mental illness as, uh, as one of the triggers for drug experimentation, and that we currently should be putting that, again, as one of our priorities, because we have an opportunity of doing an intervention that will prevent a substance use disorder, but will also improve the outcomes in mental illness. And yet, uh, we are, I mean, uh, one of the projects that I was hoping that we could launch as part of the opioid crisis was to do uh, a very thorough uh, study of how the infant brain develops 
and how it is affected by drug exposure, genetics, environment. So I, I'd like us to have standardized metrics of brain development. So if you have someone that the mother comes to you and says, I think that there's a change in behavior, you don't just have to wait six months to see if it go, runs out of it, but can actually determine is there something in the brain that leads me to think that this trajectory is abnormal, just like you do with the height and the weight of, of children. We have the tools to do it, but we don't have the standards. And that requires a, a consorted effort. So I was hoping we would be able to do this, and I'm going to keep on battling to do it, because I think it would be very, very uh, valuable. As of now, I have not succeeded to secure the, the funds that would be necessary. And that would actually, because I do think that we are likely to be able to pick up those kids that maybe have uh, this mental illness that will not be recognized until five years later. But if we intervene earlier, we can protect the, the, the actually the growth into a more severe phenotype. Right here in front. Okay. This woman here. Hi, thank you again for your remarks. I wrote down what I wanted to ask in case I got nervous. Um, so my question is, what do you think is the future of prevention efforts? And I'm asking because when I was growing up, I would always see commercials on TV that told me how bad drugs were. Uh, and I graduated the D.A.R.E. program, so the Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Um, and they probably contributed somewhat to the stigma around drug use and addiction. And I, I wonder what you think you know, now that we're trying to reduce the stigma so that people can seek treatment, how do you think we will be able to also reduce people using drugs? Well, I think that I actually, in terms of the prevention, and again, there's a whole science behind it, and you can look at it, and again, it, it also is going to be dependent. Overall, if you, like what we were discussing, if you have a, an incipient mental illness, the prevention effort is going to be different than if you don't. And so in, in terms of universal prevention, one of the things that I basically always say, if you want to prevent someone uh, to start using drugs, you want to give them alternative behaviors that motivate them and drive them. So when there was the whole thing and sort of sending the message of just say no, is the concept if you say no, you have to provide alternative reinforcers. And that's why I also end up with a slide like this one, because when you are grown up in excess poverty, where your parents are basically not, not around you, you don't have many alternatives of uh, actually a school or friends or, or family that can support you or things that you like going, and therefore drugs become a very powerful reinforcer. Our brain is hardwired to seek reinforcers. That's the way that we are created, except that there are a multiplicity of reinforcers all around you. And we all have them. But what about if you don't? Then you'll go into drug taking. So I think that the notion of being cognizant that we need to provide a social system and opportunities for our children and adolescents, including strong education, is fundamental. And then you can go into all of the other very much details about what prevention efforts can do. And, and again, they are tailored and universal, and, and, and there are cer certain uh, common elements to them, which include the strong social support systems. I just wanted to comment briefly on um, the importance of grassroots community organizations in eliminating the stigma with respect to both addiction and medication-assisted treatment. Um, I, I'm the president of a chapter of an organization called Families Against Narcotics in Michigan, and they have 21 chapters, started with one in uh, 2008. That's just one organization among many other community organizations. We have monthly public forums that educate. We go into the schools. Uh, we started a year ago a Hope Not Handcuffs program that's modeled after the Gloucester, Massachusetts um, Angel Program that in one year has about 1,200 people that we've helped into treatment. And I, I just wanted to comment on that because I know that we in Michigan are not alone and in terms of getting the message out to the community that helps eliminate the stigma that creates a barrier to recovery. I think those volunteer organizations, it's like an army of people that are basically out there and growing. So many of these organizations are led by people who've lost someone to addiction or have um, children who are in active addiction. And there is just a growing army of people that's spreading that message. 
Yeah, no, and, and thanks for bringing it up. And it pertains to the notion that we um, basically, community organizations and citizens can can be uh, instrumental in, in the, uh, containing this crisis. And as we are going to be um, putting a request for proposals to do integrated evidence-based approaches to address the opioid crisis within a depth in a given state, in ca uh, counties in a given state, we are very specifically going to be asking what are going to be the engagement with community organizations. So it's not just going to be the healthcare system, the justice system, we also want community organizations because it sort of acts like a dispersion. You, you can touch so many more people. So I, I completely agree and we're very lucky to have these organizations. Unfortunately, we are starting to see them um, coalescing and growing all over the United States, which is, of course, not something that we, we, we had 10 years ago. It's very different from what it was. We have time for one more. The mic is coming. Hi, I am Luz, and I'm uh, from the Faculty of Social Work. and. Um, in the latest years, we have talked about the physical pain and also the emotional pain and integration of trauma and substance abuse um, and the universal precautions that we can take to, to take care of the opioid crisis. But when the, uh, I work with uh, in Puerto Rico and here, and often there is a division still in the requirements to enter treatment. And if there is too much mental health history, sometimes prevents the entrance in substance abuse programs. So I think a lot of efforts need to be in the integration of both. And uh, I know that you don't know that, but how do we make that known in the community? Well, you know, first of all, again, I, I've been discussing this with the American Psychiatric Association because in terms of the uh, heads of the residency programs, that one of the things that we should be doing is when you're training psychiatrists, they should be able to actually address both the mental illness and the substance use disorder. And the last year when I was at the APA and I was meeting with uh, the heads of the departments of psychiatry, they asked me the question, I says, well, why is it that psychiatry is not one of the lead disciplines trying to, why are they not leaders on the opioid crisis? And I said, because psychiatrists have disengaged for the most part of substance use disorder. And I basically heard, I mean, very, very talented clinicians who did not realize that their patients were addicted to opioids. And they've been treating them. And, and, I, and, and, and recall, 50% of uh, opioid prescriptions are, page, are to patients with mental illness. So, and there, therefore, uh, and the comorbidity of depression and addiction, depression and pain, depression and suicide and pain, depression, suicide, pain and addiction. These are not things that are in isolated. These, these actually come together. So not to try to separate them is, is so utterly artificial. And I think that we are doing a disservice in terms of uh, the training of psychiatrists. We are working, uh, so, and, and there is an interest in actually start to create educational training programs uh, in psychiatry to actually try to change it. So we'll, and we'll help us. We are not an educational, we just conveyed our concern on this. So the APA has been responsive to this and hopefully we will start to see a change in the way that we train, we train psychiatrists. But I also want us to see a change in the way that we train medical students so that doctors themselves know how to recognize uh, um, substance use disorder and recognize depression. And so this is, a, these are very, very prevalent. So primary care physicians are going to be seeing it in their patients. So they need to be prepared to know what, how to ask, how to screen it, how to intervene. Great. Let's thank Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Volkov. Um, as my hair gets whiter, I, I find myself harder and harder to get inspired, but I am inspired. Um, so we have an hour and 15 minute break. Um, food will be served uh, somewhere in, on this floor. Um, right, so the food will be coming out. Please take the time to take a look at the posters. 